Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I'm proud to introduce you to Dr. Bridget Gomillion Williams, a chemical engineer who attributes her expertise and success in material science to her natural curiosity. Dr. Bridget, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I was reading about your background and I thought to myself, wow, this is one smart lady right here. So let's start off with your education. Did you know from the start you would be a scientist or did that realization come about during school? Um, I actually decided that I wanted to be a chemical engineer while I was in high school. Oh. It evolved from a natural uh, love of chemistry and the possibility of creating new chemicals. So, um, and then my interest in material science just kind of evolved as I got older mm -hmm. and as my education continued to progress and my exposure to different materials and just thinking about all the things that materials can do for people. Interesting. So I have to imagine, unlike me, you were very good in math and science. Yes, I was. <laughs> now I'm going to be taking notes uh, as the mother of a 15 year old who is also very good in math and science and interested in engineering. Tell me about your education. Tell me what path you took. Well, I started off as an undergraduate student at Georgia Tech, the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Initially, I, you know, everybody sits, you know, shoots far and high. And I had a classmate in my high school that actually got accepted to MIT. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to go to MIT, but couldn't afford MIT. And Georgia Tech was um, a state school that was kind of like the MIT of the South. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of their engineering programs were nationally ranked right in the top five, right along there with the MITs and the Ivy League schools of the world. Nice. Um, so... That's where I started. And then I actually, when I was 18 years old, I thought I wanted to get a PhD and then attending Georgia Tech and the classes were hard and it was, everything was rigorous. Um, then I decided, well, maybe I just want to get that bachelor's degree and get out here and make some money. So I, when I graduated from Georgia Tech, I had changed my major, by the way, while I was at Georgia Tech from chemical engineering to polymer chemistry mm -hmm. to study plastics and polymers and that. And so um, I took a job as a process engineer at Shaw Industries and kind of lasted at that for about 20 months. And then my supervisor asked me at a review, well, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I says, hmm, sitting right here looking at you. <laughs> and I thought about it, no offense. I didn't really think that was where I wanted to be in 10 years. So then it kind of made me reassess my career path. Yes. And um, watching Jurassic Park, I decided that I wanted to see how chaos theory would apply to mixing of polymers. And hence, I went on to Clemson University once I got accepted into their PhD program in material science and engineering. And my topic was looking at mixing of dissimilar materials in a, a chaotic mixer. Wow. And that chaotic mixer allows you to mix two polymers that really don't want to be mixed without any extra chemicals to make them compatible. And I was able to make new materials that way um, in this mixer that I designed that was the first of its kind. And we were awarded a patent for that. That's amazing. And by the way, I'm not sure if anyone told you, but Jurassic Park is my very favorite movie in the entire world. Okay. As a, as a matter of fact, I have now seen it at least a thousand times. There is no question <laughs> yes. about it. I was fascinated by that whole concept. As a scientist, you are really constantly questioning um, not just if you can accomplish something, but because of ethics, should you be working to accomplish something also? And so that yes. has always stuck with me um, that came from that movie. Yes. Well, the thing, that, the thing that resonated with me was chaos theory, because when they did this movie, it's scientific fiction. And so meaning that it was based on scientific fact. Chaos theory really is true and real. Okay. 
the way they applied it in the movie, though, it was a fictionalized application of the theory. So then I dug deeper into what chaos theory really was and learned it fundamentally and how it could be applied to the mixing of materials. And it turned into one of your greatest successes, obviously. Yes. So you're a senior silicone chemist. Explain to the viewers what that job exactly entails. My job entails um, creating silicone-based materials mm -hmm. for a particular application. So I work for a company called Quantix Building Products. And what we make are these flexible spaces that go in the insulated glass Okay. The double pane windows that you see that mm -hmm. keeps your, your house nice and warm or cool. Um, so what I do is I develop new materials to go into that application. I understand. Yes. Um, and uh, clearly this work puts you smack dab in the middle of what we have now turned STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And as a woman in the field, especially a woman of color, a black woman, I have to imagine you consider yourself a bit of a role model to girls who are seeking careers in these demanding fields. Well, actually, I consider myself a role model to all children of color, males and females. Yes, ma'am. Um, I tend to mentor kids based on their interests. And I also encourage young kids to pursue their passion, to continually ask themselves, what do I enjoy? Because you know your career has to be something that you love. I truly love what I do. And to give you a little story as an aside, I had a young lady contact me on Messenger and I met her when she was probably around 10 years old in my very first job. And she hit me up and she said, you really inspired me to go to college and, and be independent. Uh -huh. You know, and, and it was a very brief interaction with this young lady. You know, it was just the fact that Sometimes you have these, and she said this, you have brief interactions with people and it actually has a huge impact on their lives. Um, one of the things that uh, has always concerned me, if I can share that with you, is when people are recruiting for the significant job, such as one that you have, they don't always look to schools outside of the Ivy League schools or outside of the uh, the more mainstream schools that folk are customarily aware of for STEM opportunities. And something that I have advocated for, and I'd love to get your opinion on, if you really want to uh, have a diverse workforce, you really can't fish from the same pond. You should actually open up the opportunity for people outside of what would be considered your norm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, it's I've come across people from various backgrounds. The Georgia Tech, as you're well aware, is in Atlanta, Georgia. And so we're, we're right in the backyard of Morehouse and Spelman and all the HBCUs right there. We're all sitting there within, I would say, maybe 10, 15 miles of each other. Um, and so you have students that have come from an HBCU and come to Georgia Tech. Um, you have a person that goes to Georgia Tech and decide they want to go to medical school and maybe they want to go to Morehouse Medical School. Mm -hmm. um, so the main thing is, is that what we need to do is we need to start letting people know that they're talented people, no matter where they end up going to school. If they end up going to a school that's a private institution that's kind of off the beaten path and and potentially doesn't have the quote unquote reputation in US News and World Report, doesn't mean you're getting a lesser student or a lesser professional. It's just the fact that that person decided to take a slightly different path to get to the same destination. So I would encourage people to, you know, I would encourage, I've encouraged places where I've worked to go to these HBCUs yes. that um, aren't necessarily on their recruiting list. I always say talent is universal. It's opportunity that is not. And right. this is a wonderful example of how um, opening the table to brilliant people. If you put, put out your job uh, opportunity uh, flyer and it says brilliant people apply, I'd like to see brilliant people from all over the place come in and be a part of that process. 
Um, you know, doctor, sometimes it's easy for us to lose track of how our work does indeed make a difference. I appreciate you sharing a couple of things with me, but do you ever have the opportunity to actually see the fruits of your labor improving the world we live in? Um, actually the things that you touch and have created. Well, interestingly enough, I've worked in a lot of early stage research and development, which means that you're going from a concept that this product doesn't even exist. Okay. And so when you're working in, um, in mainstream industry, sometimes what we think our customers are looking for doesn't mesh with what they're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get beyond us just showing them that it actually can happen and it doesn't get out into the mainstream. So that was when I worked at Dow Chemical. And then when I ended up working for St. Cobain, um, working in health sciences or health, health markets where I worked on a, a piping, a tubing that went into peristaltic pumps. Now, what is a peristaltic pump you might wanna ask? Yes, indeed. Well, it's a pump that can precisely meter the fluid that is pumping, say blood. So now in this case, peristaltic pumps are used when they're doing open heart surgery. When they stop your heart, they have to pump your blood. They have to keep your blood pumping so it doesn't clot, right? So this peristaltic pump is very important because the heart is stopped and your blood is being circulated through these silicone tubings that will not cause a clotting to happen because your body doesn't see silicone rubber as being a foreign thing so it won't clot. But the one thing you don't want to happen is for that tubing to fail because once it fails, your blood is on the floor. So that's very impactful. You um, wanna have something you know it's gonna perform in a very high demanding health related issue. Okay, so Dr. B, what you don't know, um, <laughs> as you've just scared the bejeebies out of me because 11 years ago, March, I had open heart surgery. Oh my gosh. They stopped my heart for 22 minutes and the heart lung machine did indeed keep me alive for those 22 minutes. Yes. And I can guarantee some of those silicone pumps that you are describing actually were the pumps that were used to keep me alive. So yes. you see, I asked you earlier if you could actually see the fruits of your labor improving the world we live in. Well, you're <laughs> talking to someone who is alive today because of the work that you do. There's no question about it. You can't do open heart surgery without the materials that you have already outlined for us. So may I say thank you? <laughs> may I say thank you? Yes, you can. Thank yes, you. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Me. Absolutely. Yeah. That is just one of the most wonderful things to be able to hear from someone that they had a hand in the materials that actually kept you alive. Um, yes. Other than that, keeping those of us who are heart disease survivors alive, tell me about some of the other satisfying projects that you've worked on throughout your career. Well, I tell you the very first thing I worked on when I created that, um, continuous flow chaotic mixer in, in my PhD work. That was very satisfying because the Dow Chemical Company took my expertise and we started developing plastic products. We called it, it was a, it was a rapid development type platform that they developed around that mixer so that we could actually mix commodity plastics together to make plastics that have like a synergy or design set of properties based on what you're mixing together. Okay. So these aren't reacted together. They're just actually mixed together. And when they're mixed together, the intertwining of those two plastics will make a plastic that's different than each of those singular plastics are alone. Well, see, look at you. Look at you being the professor <laughs> and teaching the student today. I love it. Absolutely. So what are some of the goals that you've set for yourself? And, and, and tell me how you plan on achieving them. My initial goal as a PhD was to become a professor, to let young people see a woman, a black woman being a professor and teaching them about their craft. And what I decided was after looking at my two advisors, because I had two of them, by the way, for my PhD, what I learned from them was that one guy he had, well, both, neither one of them had ever worked in industry. So they were academics. 
And what I want to be able to do is show my students how you can reduce this academic learning to something that's real, that you can go out and really apply it. And it, this isn't just an exercise for you to get a degree and then not use it. So my next goal is to become a professor and, and, and basically torture other people's children, to be honest. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time today. And um, just the work that you have done reminds me of one of my very favorite quotes from one of my very favorite authors, and that's Zora Neale Hurston. And she said, research is formalized curiosity. It's poking and prying with a purpose. And it seems like that is exactly who you are and what you've done throughout your career. Congratulations, doctor. I'm very proud to know you. Thank you. And I'm very happy that you took the time to talk to me today. Absolutely. Have a <laughs> wonderful day. And I look forward to finding out in the next year that new project. Yeah, I would, you know, that's when I sat down and I thought about it, I said, geez, when I saw that one question, I said, I haven't really, I'm still creating, but I'm in the midst of what I think is going to be one of the biggest achievements of my career. And in about a year's time, we'll, we'll be talking about it. Well, I'm looking forward to not just talking about it, but sharing the news. And you know, I'm good at that. Thank you very, <laughs> very much. Thank you.